Good morning. If you want to open your New Testaments to the book of Acts, we'll start our study here in just a couple of minutes. It's good to see you all. In talking about the church, we find the church identified in at least two ways in the New Testament. First, it's the body of Christ. How well do you know your own body? Probably like me, you get up in the morning, you go in, you look in that bathroom mirror, and you go, yep, there I am. (laughs) And it's not whether or not we like everything about our bodies. It's whether or not we know that's, that's my body. Do we care for that body? Another way the church is identified in the New Testament is as the bride of Christ. And every young man thinks of the day he will choose that one young lady to be his bride. And then he commits himself to her and she becomes precious to him. And it's something every husband has to maintain. But that preciousness should indeed be maintained. And it's a silly question to ask, well, can a man identify his wife when he sees her? Although there was a game, I, I call it a game, I think it was kind of a, an icebreaker thing at a party. Years ago, before I was even married, we had this church function and, and they had this fun thing to do. They had all the, all the men in one room and they took all the wives into another room. And then all the wives came out together, but they were all lined up side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and they had sheets in front of them so you couldn't see anything except their feet. And they had taken their shoes off, and all the wives come out, and they're covered up in sheets. You can't see who's behind the sheet except for the feet. And guess what all the husband had to do? They said, husbands, go stand in front of your wife based on your recognition of her feet. There was actually one guy, (laughs) bless his heart, he kept going around. (laughs) How familiar with our wives should we be? Oh, we should be very familiar. Now, if if that's the way it is with the church, shouldn't we be able to, to look at the church and identify the church when we see it? And so as we go through Acts, just, just portions of Acts this morning, I'm going to have us take a look at some of the aspects of the church that we really ought to be able to recognize because it's as Jesus determined it would be. Starting in Acts chapter 1, look at chapter 1 verse 4. Jesus, gathering them together, commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at, is, uh, at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said for them, It is not for you to know the times of the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Where are they going to be his witnesses? He says, In Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, where else? even to the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's the long-term plan. Jesus says, you go to Jerusalem and you wait. I'm going to send you power from on high, and when that comes, you're going to be my witnesses. What do witnesses do? Witnesses testify. They stand up and they say, this is what we have seen. This is what we know. We bear witness. We testify to what we know to be the truth. That's that's the purpose of a witness. And Jesus says that these guys are going to be his witness to Jerusalem, Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost part of the earth. In chapter 2, we can pick it up where the apostles receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it sits on them like cloven tongues of fire, and they hear a sound. The sound is like a mighty rushing wind. And each one of the apostles are given the ability to speak in foreign languages that they've never studied before. And as you read through the second chapter, the first part of the second chapter, you can see that the purpose is that everybody would come together and go, what in the world is going on? It got people's attention. And once they had their attention, Peter is the one who stood up in their midst and he began at verse 22. And when he starts talking at chapter two and verse 22, or chapter two and verse 22, 
Who does he begin preaching about? And you probably know this without even looking at the text. He immediately begins to tell them about Jesus. This is what he says. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you also yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And then he goes on to elaborate from the Old Testament passages that witness to this, that bear testimony to this all taking place. What did Peter just preach? But the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the theme of Peter's sermon, but it's the theme of Acts. It is the theme of the New Testament. It is the theme that God has given his son's church the death and the burial and the resurrection of his son. And when you keep on reading, as, as Peter concludes his sermon, look, his, look at his conclusion in verse 36. By the way, don't pay any attention to the length of this sermon. I'm not nearly as good a preacher, uh, preacher I'm sure, as Peter, so I've got to preach a lot longer to accomplish the same amount of good. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. At any rate, his conclusion is in verse 36. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's preached Jesus to them. How do they respond? Verse 37 says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. That's what the word of God is designed to do. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 said it pierces asunder, separating bone and marrow and tissue. It's, it's like a two-edged sword. And it pierces to the heart. And these people were pierced to the heart. And you know that they believe the message because of the question they ask. What do they ask? They say, what are we going to do? Now, now just get, get the scene as best you can in your mind. These folks are Jews. And just 50 days prior to this, they cried out publicly for the death of Jesus. And Jesus was put to death. And so, realizing they've killed the Son of God, they want to know what to do. And Peter tells them very clearly, very plainly, what they're supposed to do. He says, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And when I read that part about many who are far off, I have to believe that God is not just talking about far off geographically, but I believe he's talking about far off even in time. This was almost 2,000 years ago. Are we those who are far off? Not just geographically, but far off in time. And it's the same message for us today. None of this has changed. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that fantastic? What would it be like, and I've, I've thought about this, <clears throat> how fortunate I am to be a preacher of the gospel of Christ because the gospel never changes. I don't have to stay updated. I, I really appreciate mechanics and people who work in technical fields because things are changing so fast. I remember one of my first vehicles was a 1950 model GMC pickup. And I love that old truck. You pop the hood and there's a 235 straight six cylinder in there with a carburetor sitting on. Everything was right there. And there was so much room in that engine compartment, you could climb in there with it if you needed to work on it. And everything was readily identifiable. You try that with a modern day car. Just try to find the dipstick. And don't be looking around the room pointing fingers. I'm talking about the one in your car. But this gospel is the same. It's ageless. It's never changed. And so we preach the same thing today that was preached then, the same gospel. And what it says is that uh, with many other words, he said in verse 40, he solemnly testified. There he's testifying, bearing witness, just like Jesus said. And he kept on exhorting them the more, saying, be saved from this generation. So then those who received his word, 
They received what he said and they were baptized and that day where there were added about 3,000 souls. And then it says in verse 47, they were all praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. But as he teaches us these things, he gives us in verse 42, four things to which they were continually devoting themselves. Number one was to the apostles' teaching. The church devotes itself to the apostles' teaching. Is that what we do today? It should be, should it not? They were devoting themselves to fellowship. Did you hear any announcements about fellowship? This is something new. We're going to be getting together with uh, every family in a, in a group of threes. And having dinner with one another. What a great idea is that? That's fellowship. I would hope that most of our fellowship isn't something that has to be assigned by the leadership of the church. I would hope that most of our fellowship is that that we want to have with one another because we just enjoy being with each other. And so we fellowship, we talk, we visit, we share in each other's lives. It also says in verse 42 that they continually devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. I don't think he's talking about meals here. I think he's talking about what we just did a little while ago. Because Jesus is the one who gave them that bread to break. And they continually devoted themselves to that. And it says they continually devoted themselves to prayer. Do we do that? We do. Because we want to be identified as the church of Jesus Christ. Now these are just four things here. But we're already saying this, that that we listen to Jesus just like the apostles listened to Jesus. We preach the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. We teach people to respond to that gospel in the same way they did. We pay attention to the, the four things that are here and we try to do that. And I'm not saying that just because I'm trying to, to say, oh, good, good for us. Let's, let's pat ourselves on the back. The point is we know that these are identifying marks of the Lord's church. And so we do these things so that we might be the Lord's church. Now you read through the, the rest of Acts and up through about chapter 12, we're seeing most of what Peter did. And in chapter 13 and following, we're seeing the works of Paul and what Paul did. But through the way, we pick up on little uh, intimacies, I might say, about the church. In chapter 4, in verse 32, we read this. Chapter 4, 32, there arose a financial need among the members of the church. And it doesn't specify, but probably the reason is because they had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost and just imagine that they would be staying a certain amount of time and then leaving when the feast was over. Probably what happened, they realized this is the kingdom that the old prophets told us was coming. And it's been established. We don't want to just go home right now. We want to stay longer and find out about this kingdom and sit at the feet of the apostles and learn. That's probably the situation. And so it says in verse 32 of chapter 4, the congregation of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. What did the early church do but take care of its own? Isn't that what we try to do today? We may not be perfect at it, but we're making a stab, trying to take care of our own. And it's marvelous, is it not, to live in a nation so blessed materially that this is not the problem that it does, is in other places of the world. And yet we share our finances with those who need our help. Because that's what the church does. If we're going to be the body of Christ, that's another aspect of the body that we need to uh, take upon ourselves so that we might be recognized as the body of Christ. Now, if you go to chapter 6, a problem arises in the church. I know you've never heard about churches having problems, but this congregation had a problem. It said in chapter 6, verse 1, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number... And this is just a parenthetical statement. I want you to notice this when you read Acts. And my assumption is that you'll read Acts. 
you'll see that the preaching of the gospel kept going, kept going, kept people kept talking about Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And every time they did, their numbers increased. Their numbers increased. And the number of the saints, it says in chapter 6, uh, verse 1, was increasing. A complaint arose, however, on part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples together and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the words of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. And we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And of course, what they did was they chose seven men, gives those men's names and their qualifications, and they brought them before the apostles in verse 6. They prayed and they laid their hands on them. And these guys, I believe, became what we would now call the first deacons in the church. What does the word deacon mean? Do you know? It means servant. Deacon means minister. Now, how many of those who are part of the body of Christ... How many of those who are part of the bride of Christ are to be ministers? Everybody. Everybody is supposed to be a minister. Each one of us are to minister. As Jesus said, we're to be salt and light and cities on hills so that we might have an impact through our good works. And people might glorify God by those. But in the church that's filled with ministers, there are certain who are set apart and designated to be Special ministers, that's what these guys are. Special deacons appointed over specific works. And that's what these guys were. So now when you go into a congregation of the Church of Christ, you'll probably see somewhere in that building a poster that says, here are our deacons. It's interesting to me that we haven't yet talked about elders. Have you noticed that? Well, we won't talk about elders until we get to the 11th chapter. And if, in fact, these guys are deacons, and I so see no good reason not to think that they are, they're not called deacons at this point, but I think they will be later. We're in chapter 6, and we won't even talk about elders until chapter 11. What's the reason for that? Well, as the church began, who were the leaders? The leaders were the apostles. And in time, their mantle of authority and leadership went from them to those who would later be called on as elders of the church. Because when we get to chapter 11 and we read about elders, there's, we're just seeing that they're there. They exist. They're part of the church. It's almost assumed that we would understand that there would be elders or shepherds as leaders in the church. And there's no discussion about even how they were at that point appointed. Later on, we'll read about the appointment of elders in Titus and in 2 Timothy. But in Acts, boom, they're just there. And so we've got this church that preaches the gospel and everything's central around Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. We've got a church that commits itself to the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper and to prayer and the fellowship of the saints and the teaching of the apostles. We've got a church that commits itself to taking care of its own. We've got a church that has deacons. We've got a church that we'll see in the next text that continues to preach even when they are persecuted. If I were to ask you to take out a piece of paper and write down all the times and all the ways in which you have been persecuted as being a Christian, well, how much would you have to write down? Now, some of you may really have some good things. About the best I can come up with is, well, somebody called me a name once. How about you? I've never been put in prison because I'm a Christian. I've never been run out of town because of my faith in Christ. I've had some people say and think bad things about me and talk about me behind my back because of my Christianity, but big deal. In chapter 8 of Acts, we're coming on to the tail end of what historical event in the church. What happened in chapter 7, the last part of chapter 7, Stephen, the preacher, was put to death. They killed him by throwing rocks at him. And while they were throwing rocks at him, there was a young man who was holding the coats of all those who were throwing the rocks. His name was Saul. And it says Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. This is chapter 8 of Acts, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered 
throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. By the way, what had Jesus said earlier about Judea and Samaria? That you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and then in Judea and then in Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the world. It says some devout men buried Stephen and they made a loud lamentation over him, but Saul ravaging, began ravaging the church, entering into house after house and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. I've never really worried about anybody banging on my door and hauling me off to jail because I'm a member of the Lord's church. How about you? What happens in verse 4? Those who'd been scattered by persecution when everywhere doing what? They preached the word. I'm not going to ask you if you have any reason to be embarrassed this morning. As you read this, here are people who've embraced Jesus Christ. And because of they've, they're embracing Christ, they've been persecuted, pushed out of the town they were in. But where they go, they go everywhere telling people about Jesus Christ. I've never been pushed out of anywhere. Well, I take that back. I was kicked out of one house up in Rapid City. That was an interesting story, too. I was studying with a young lady. Uh, there was a, a two of us in there studying with a young lady. She was only 18 years old, sweet young lady. And she just was soaking up the scriptures like a sponge. And I asked her to read Acts 22, 16. You know what Acts 22, 16 says? Ananias asked Peter, Why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's all she did. I hadn't said a thing. The young lady read that verse. Her grandmother came through the kitchen as we were having this study, and she heard her granddaughter read that verse. And she looked at me with eyes that could pierce stainless steel, and she asked me, Are you trying to tell my granddaughter that she's got to be baptized in order to be saved? And you know how the wheels start turning. <laughs> said, what am I going to say? How am I going to respond to this lady? I didn't get a chance to say a thing. The granddaughter jumped. But grandma, look what it says right here. And grandmother wasn't going to have anything to do with it. And the granddaughter, bless her heart, kept trying to get her grandmother just to read the verse that she had just read. And next thing I know, me and the, uh, the uh, lady that I'm there studying with her with her out in the street. Get out of my house, she said. Now, if you feel pity for me, you need to repent. Because <laughs> I'm nearly 60 years old. And for the preaching of the cross, that's the first time and only time I've ever been thrown out of anybody's house. There are people in the, word who are, in the world who are suffering for Jesus Christ. We need to be aware of that. And we need to learn from Acts chapter 8 to be willing for that to happen. And when it happens, not to stifle ourselves, but to keep on preaching Jesus Christ. That's the only hope for the world. Amen? There is no other hope but that. And so these guys did it, and I read about them, and I think that's what I want to do. I want to keep on preaching about Jesus Christ. And then we get to chapter 10. What happens in chapter 10? Well, there aren't any Gentiles in the church yet, and here's a man who is a Gentile. He's a non-Jew. And he is a righteous man. It says in Acts chapter 10 of this fellow by the name of Cornelius. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. You can't get a, much of a better description of that as somebody who's devoted to God. That was Cornelius. And so God sends Peter to preach to Cornelius. And Peter preaches the exact same gospel to Cornelius that he's preached to everybody else. And as a result, Cornelius and his entire family are baptized into Christ. What's, what's the point? The point is when you get to Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Peter says this. I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation... In every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Every nation. Boy, are we divided in this country right now over race? At least it seems like we are. It sounds like we are. If you watch the news, you watch the media, everything's about this dichotomy. Oh, black lives or white lives. It's not about black lives or white lives. 
It's about the fact that we're all sinners. Sin is the one thing that is common to us all. And there's only one common salvation for sin. And that's the Jesus that the church is preaching as we read through Acts. It's the same story. Same story for Cornelius and his household as it is for everybody else. And so the church is not supposed to be biased. The church is supposed to be open to all, regardless of color, regardless of politics. And that's good, because I really haven't found anybody yet who I totally agree with politically. How about you? There's all kinds of crazy people out there. It's like, and I think I mentioned this not too long ago in a sermon or a Bible class, of all people to quote in a sermon, uh, George Carlin <laughs> talked about when you're driving down the highway. He made the observation, if they're going faster than you are, they're maniacs. And if they're going slower than you are, they're idiots. Now tell me that's not the truth when we get on the highway. You're going down the road and you get behind some guy, and I don't mind if he's in the right-hand lane, because the right-hand lane is for all the slow pokes. But if you're in that left-hand lane and you're up there even with the guy who's going slow, then have I got off my point here just a little bit? <laughs> but you see how this illustrates the way it is. We can identify certain things in life that are, are right or wrong, and, and we make judgments about those things. And what we need to do is get our heads in this book and make judgments about what was the church like and then be like that. Be like Jesus. Follow his teaching as he gave it to the apostles in the first century saints. We need to shape ourselves like the church was shaped in the first century. People who loved and cared about each other, had fellowship with one another. People who were devoted to the apostles' teaching and taking care of each other through their own finances. People who welcomed people from other uh, cultures and, and races, although technically there's only one race, but, but that's the way we need to be when we look at the church. And then we get to chapter 11. I mentioned this a while ago. We'll come back to it here. And all it says about the elders is that once again, there was a financial need and the church took up a collection. And with this money that they collected from among themselves, they did good. And it says they sent it Sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul, this is Acts chapter 11 and verse 30. They sent it to the elders. Boom, we got elders. How did that happen? Don't know. But when we read the rest of the New Testament, we can see what elders are supposed to do. Oh, they're supposed to shepherd the flock. How many different words are there for elders? Well, there's elders and there's shepherd. And there's pastor. Well, all pastor is is... It's a French derivation of the word for shepherd. So we're, we're back to shepherds. There are bishops. What does the word bishop mean? Well, it's from the Greek episkopos, which means episcope. Epi means everything and scope means to see. You, you see everything. You look over. Episcope. You, you overlook the church. Presbyter is a word that means an older person. So we're talking about somebody who's got enough years behind them that, that they have an idea or should have an idea what they're doing. That's... Yeah, should have, because not every time do you meet somebody who's older. Well, we just won't go into that anymore. They're probably the ones who are in that left lane behind that. <laughs> yeah. Now, the reason, the reason I bring these things up is because, have you noticed that there are all kinds of religions in the world today? And even within Christendom, there are all kinds of churches. And it really should not be like that. And I'm not standing up here to place judgment on anybody. I'm standing up here to call us back to what the scriptures say. By the way, when it talks about elders, you may notice as you read through the New Testament that every time it mentions elders, it's always in the plural. There's never just one elder. Now, is that significant? To me, it's significant. It's like that story about the, the young housewife who always cut the end off her ham. You've heard that story, haven't you? That's an old one. It's such a good one, though. And her husband asked her one day, Honey, why do you cut the end off the ham? And she said, Well, I don't know. My mom always did, so I do. And she went back and asked her mom, Mom, why do you cut the end off the ham? 
And her mom says, honey, I didn't have a pan big enough to put it in, so I always cut the end off of it. Why do we do things? We should know that. We should know why we do what we do. When we come in here in the morning, and if somebody comes in here and says, hey, why do you guys sing? Should you be able to give them a reason for why we sing? Yeah, sure you should. If they say, well, how, how come you got a guy that gets up there and leads a prayer? Should we be able to explain to folks? Should we be able to explain to folks why we, why we pray? How come you have a guy get up there and talk to you for 15 minutes? How come you don't believe in telling the truth? <laughs> Everything we do, we ought to be able to go back to the book and say, this, this is why we do it. And furthermore, when, when we go somewhere else, with the love of God in our hearts and in our mouths, we ought to be able to ask other folks, how come you don't do it according to what the book says here? Because we might just be putting them in mind of something they need to pay a little more attention to. The church. Are we the church? How do we know if we're the church? Well... We look at this book, and if we're doing what's in the book, we know we're the church. And there are the aspects of having deacons and having elders and meeting on the first day of the week. But there are also the things that Jesus taught us that he said were the weightier things of the law. Justice, mercy, the two greatest commandments, what are they? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And then love your neighbor as yourself. These things make us the church. Which ones can we leave off? We don't leave off anything. We call Jesus our Lord. And he asked a question about that. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Can you finish it? And then do not do the things I say. It's a penetrating question. It's one that pierces the heart like Peter's sermon pierced the heart. And it should pierce ours. So that we would every single day we live want to do what we do because Jesus wants us to do it. It's not about legalism. It's not about being perfect. This is what it's about. If, if it's your birthday... What is everybody supposed to be about? They're supposed to be about your birthday. What do you want to have to eat that night? Uh, what do you want for, for birthday presents? Now, if we just do this for one another kind of thing, because we have birthdays, what should we do for God who gave us the universe and our lives and has given us his son to set us up for the future. We're set up. We've got a furnished mansion waiting for us. Pretty good deal, isn't it? And it all goes back to us being this before we get there. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful to you for what you've done for us. And we pray that in our lives we will return to you the honor that you have shown us. And the respect and regard you've shown us. We pray that we will live in such a way that our lives will be shining beacons of light. That your righteousness and the goodness of your Son will shine out of, of our speech and of our actions. And as we get together as your people to celebrate and worship you, we pray that all we do will glorify you. And that it will be traced right back to the word you've given us. So that we might be said to be your people, your children. Lord bless us this day in this that we might continue this way. It's a scary thing sometimes to look out into the world, but we know you're not afraid of the world. And we pray that we will never be so afraid of that world that we would ever allow it to change us. But rather that we would so love and regard you that we will keep your pattern, we will keep your ways, we will live your love until our dying day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since the gospel's not changed, if you would like to respond to it this morning, we'll do the same thing for you they did on Pentecost. We'll ask you to repent of your sin, confess Christ, and we'll bury you in baptism. And you'll rise to walk in newness of life. If you need prayer, that's what they did. That's what we'll do.
So if we need, uh, or if you need us to help you in any way, just come forward this morning while we sing, and we'll be glad to help as we can. Let's stand and sing.